So we're talking about Rousseau. Rousseau, uh, we've already seen, he was the contemporary of Voltaire and Diderot. And together, these three people, Rousseau, Voltaire, and Diderot, they are called the unholy trio, the profane trio. And uh, we remember him for his uh, pioneering thoughts and uh, writings that gave a lot of importance to emotions and uh, the human mind rather than the intellect and rationality. He was uh, quite skeptical and doubtful about using just the thought process or the rational faculty. So he can be seen as a pioneer of the uh, romantic movement, the romantic literary movement, and then uh, contributed quite a lot on the modern system of pe pedagogy, that is education. So he's remembered as one of the forefathers of the education system that we know today. So many of the beliefs with which we teach children or using which we design courses for teaching young children is actually based on his ideas and his historical mission. You know, his declared historical mission was to create a political philosophy wherein the common good of the whole people. He talks about the social contract. We'll be coming to that later. He talks about the social contract rather than believing in things that are believed by the masses, the views of the masses. And he said uh, Christianity or religion can go hand in hand with the rationality and materialism. You don't have to see them as binary things. That is, if you're relig religious, that doesn't mean that you renounce everything and you have to uh, forego all kinds of rational thinking and you need to be poor. You don't need all those kind of things. He says you can very well have a synthesis between your faith, rationality, and materialism. Materialism is wherein you make use of money and you're being very practical about it. So he called it the materialism of the wise, theism, or the civil religion. So he is mainly remembered for his contribution towards education. And he believed that we all have this natural inclination in us. There's something there in each one of us which makes us close to nature, that kind of a harmony. But somewhere this harmony was lost because of civilization. So there was this distrust of reason and then this uh, emphasizing emphasizing on that natural inclination that forms the basis of all modern educational movement so there are different people who have given different theories of education but when you look at all of them you will find that this emphasis on the natural inclination that is there is something in each one of us human beings that makes us inclined towards nature towards goodness Th that goodness is there in each one of us because we feel, you know, we feel hurt when we see some uh, somebody suffering, and it this is the basis of all good behavior. All right, so that that's what he believed in, and the way his style of writing is kind of confessional. So he can also be called as um, one of the pioneers of the style of modern autobiography. So his theory of education can be found in this seminal work. This uh, very famous work called Emil or on education that's the title of the book so he's inquiring into the possibilities of reintegrating man with nature and try trying to divide the gap gap between nature and history so he's saying that this is time you know this is the time that you have to go back to nature maybe we cannot go back to nature in the way we were once upon a time that is many years back in the past, the kind of harmony that human beings had with nature. It's not possible right now. We cannot leave our offices, our jobs, and we cannot go back and live in the jungle like the ancient people. That's not possible. But then still, to some extent, we can open our mind and then try and see this beautiful relationship between human beings and nature. So as a result of this belief, he was suspicious of civilization, urban social life, where a lot of importance is given to achievements, wherein life is a mad rush, wherein everybody is trying to outdo each other.
so he is quite uh, suspicious of this kind of a civilization he says let's not have these kind of unhealthy competition let's go back and then enjoy that harmony with nature so now he is saying that there is this need for humanity to regain that initial harmony that was there between man and nature and this harmony was lost due to civilization and history and because of civilization we have forgotten like who we are who are we we are part of nature we are just a cog in the whole thing we are just a part of the whole thing but then because of the civilization we have become far removed from this realization that we are a part of nature so he gives a lot of emphasis on human beings natural inclination and another interesting thing about his theory is he say, he tells us not to give books to little children he says let the initial part of education be based on learning things from nature let them see experience and then form opinions about it from first hand experience you don't need anybody to tell them through books because books have this tendency to excite imagination and desire so that in that initial stages he says keep children away from books let them learn from nature let them do things let them experience it and then let them learn from that and he was very much influenced by robinson crusoe likewise uh, his work emil also wherein the character emil he is isolated from society so he it turns out to be a very pure and a very gentle soul because he is free from the vanity fear and desire for reward which is actually a, a hallmark of civilization because when you are living in a society you will be corrupted by vanity fear desire for reward you want to win you want to put down others all that would become a part of your life so this person in the character emil he is isolated and he grows up in the lap of nature therefore he is not smeared by any of these evils that are a by product of civilization and then he says human beings we should not accept anything on authority so emil the character he is teaching us that is not to take anything based on authority that is if your boss tells you you obey it or you take it without questioning it or somebody superior a priest tells you something so you believe it that should not be the case so don't accept anything just because it comes from authority instead what are we supposed to do we are supposed to use our own experiences and instincts make judgments and then accept it so always question and then ask your heart ask your heart whether this is correct whether this appeals to you whether this makes sense whether believing in this thing would hurt somebody you know, those kind of questions those kind of beliefs are to be imbibed by us so we become master of our own self and we become free we become free from all these kind of authorities these kind of people who try to make our behavior conformed to their standards or to their beliefs so he believes in negative education now what is negative education it's nothing but a positive exclusion from the larger world it's kind of unlearning whatever has been there in civilization whatever is there in society so this is negative education negative education as in you are unlearning the things that are taught by civilization and by society so what happens to you you become very close to nature you make use of your natural inclinations and then based on your experience your sense perception and your mind that is you are asking yourself and based on that you reach a conclusion that's how you're supposed to learn that is education according to him now another interesting uh, theory that he has spoken about is uh, something called the social contract social contract is is his idea of uh, telling us how we should be living in a society so as a human being see initially we need to get education we need to be close to nature we need to understand this harmony that is there between us and nature all that is fine and then later you learn from books and then you become quite mature and after that 
you are a part of society it is not practical for you to run away to the forest and live there that is not possible you you have to be in society right but in order to survive in the society and in order to have a very good compassionate and human society there are certain things that he is theorizing so if everyone lives by these understandings these kind of uh, theories he says the society would be a much better place so this uh, is actually a kind of a dissertation on the contract between an individual and society so his theory tells us that there has to be a kind of a contract between a human being and society and then he says our society and our civilization has become so chaotic and it is so stifling that man is born free but everywhere he is in chains chains of different kinds beliefs and cult you know value systems things that we don't really understand so everywhere we are bound by chains but then as a conscientious citizen you, you you're supposed to break free from these chains so he says that he reiterates that is he says again and again he emphasizes that there is blessing in the collective organized life so that is if society is really organized and everybody works for the benefit of each other you can have really a good life so what is this contract it is a willing act on the part of the individual to submit himself to the general will while retaining his freedom so what is this contract just understanding that the society is more important the common good of the society is more important than my own personal will but at the same time i have my own freedom you understand and i will exercise this freedom with restraint i know where the limits are i understand that everybody is just like me so i respect the freedom of other people that's a collective kind of a feeling wherein you're feeling for humanity that is the general will of the people wherein you're talking about the society the whole community above the individual so what is more important the collective the collective general will is more important than the individual will but at the same time that individual freedom is also important and why does he say that because it's not possible for us now to go back to the primitive way of life but then in order to be happy in this world you need to have certain things in control you cannot go back wearing you know fig leaves and eating apple and you cannot go back to the garden of eden right that's not possible but then what is possible is you can control your selfishness you know you have to ensure that you don't gather wealth at the cost of another so something like a socialist leaning is here when you're talking about the collective good when you're talking about the whole community it is kind of a socialism all right so that kind of a socialism wherein the individual is not supposed to amass or hoard and collect with greed whatever wealth he can so he's saying don't collect too much take only as much as you need like later we can see gandhi speaking about that there is enough for everybody's need but not enough for everybody's greed so it's the same kind of socialistic kind of a thinking wherein you're talking about the good of the whole humanity wherein you want to give to everyone don't be selfish and don't take away more than what you require so uh, people are sovereign he says people are sovereign sovereign as in they are very free they are free they are in control of their own lives and and what is the duty of the government the government has to be responsible to people and help them exercise this sovereignty that is it is the duty of the government to take care of the people and to see to it that they become sovereign that is the individual human rights the individual uh principles values are upheld by the government it is the duty of the government to ensure that there is a conducive society to live wherein these individual freedom can be exercised without hurting the common will of the society so that is the function of a government and then he talks about if there is a civil religion it will ensure complete commitment 
from the people so there is uh, there has to be something like a civil religion wherein uh, everybody is taught to be good honest and not selfish to become sensible and sensitive to the needs requirements of other people when this kind of a civil religion is there then what will happen everyone would fall into place everyone will follow the same so there will not be any discord there will not be any uh, difficulty or problem all right so already we have seen what did he believe in you know when it comes to religion and faith he says christianity can be mixed with it can be synthesized with reason and materialism you don't have to make it binary so you can be a good religion religious person but at the same time you can be rational that is you, you can have a scientific temperament and at the same time you can even handle money you can be a part of the world materialistic materialistic need not be a negative term according to him so that is his idea of civil religion so if you have this kind of a civil religion and when you have this kind of a social contract wherein each one of us would become part of a society and we submit ourselves to the common good the general will of the community but at the same time retaining our own freedom and then he's basing all this based on his idea of the primitive man primitive man as in it's it's a, a call to go back a call to go back as in uh, a desire to go back to the uh, previous times wherein we were living in close contact with nature we were not corrupted by the influences of the city life wherein we were not affected by the uh, rush or the rat race of civilization so uh, when you look at rousseau you can see that he is one of the earliest critics of the enlightenment's obsession with progress see when we are talking about the this particular century you are talking about the french revolution and other revolutions all over the world what do we see there is this one common thread that was connecting all these thinkers and all these movements and what is that it is that obsession with progress they are talking about science technology rationality all that is fine to some extent but then if you are talking only about progress without thinking about the human being and without really taking into consideration the detrimental effects of this obsession with progress you are actually missing the bus so he can be seen as one of the first critics of that period though he was a very influential thinker from that time he differs from the other thinkers because most of them were thinking about progress and talking about rationality but here you you find a drift of someone who goes in the opposite direction so according to him the primitive man the earlier human beings they were like noble savages maybe they are savages savage as in jungly he or she may not know the niceties uh, or the nice behavior or the kind of language the refinement that you are supposed to have in a society all that may be missing in that person but then that person would be noble noble as in the person would be good at heart he or she will never harm his fellow being he will always think about others so that there is some kind of a nobility in that primitive human being so he was against this enlightenment view of rationalism as the highest point of progress because all the other philosophers of that time they gave a lot of importance to rationalism and they believed that that was the highest point of progress wherein you use only your rational faculty and then he says morality morality is actually not a social construct that is you don't learn morality from society as such but actually morality is nothing but a natural impulse and it comes from our inability to see pain in other people so we know if we do something wrong it will hurt somebody and that hurt you know that human tendency is to feel empathy you see somebody crying in pain or writhing in pain what is that human natural tendency to help that person 
to try and comfort that person so it is this sense that is there in us that is making us moral human beings you don't need to go to any church or you don't need to go to any university to learn this that is to be a human being human it comes naturally to us but civilization socialization all this has actually created a wide gap between this natural humanity that is there in us and uh, what do you call all these moral impulses so so you cannot say morality was created by society morality is there already in us nobody need to tell us what is right and what is wrong our mind can tell us yes based on experiences based on our own understanding of human nature we understand what is right and what is wrong so this inability to see pain in others would help us to behave in a better manner and then he says the more we are away from the urban centers of moral pollution the healthier and purer we would be so it's better that you stay away from these big cities these uh, you could say centers of civilization wherein people give a lot of importance to progress success and all kinds of achievement so where can you find perfect happiness according to him it's a rural environment that is the villages the rural environment because there you have more liberty you have greater self esteem and people are happy with what they have so it's a very idealistic kind of a view wherein he's talking about the primitive man maybe we cannot go back to the jungle again but at least we can try to be somewhere near to that noble savage that we all were once upon a time all our ancestors were that this is what he believes in all right so this is about rousseau so when we are talking about rousseau we need to talk about his theory of education then his uh, theory of social contract and his idea about the primitive man so these are the main three things and then rousseau is always remembered as one of the pioneers of the romantic movement so with rousseau you can find a shift a shift or a breaking away from this obsession with progress towards nobility towards goodness towards emotion getting in touch with our own inner selves so all that can be seen in rousseau so he he can be considered as a pioneer to the romantic movement and this distrust of civilization reason progress all that sets him apart from the other thinkers of the period because all, almost all the other thinkers were obsessed with rationality progress uh, human thinking those kind of things they were not talking about the human emotions so he is that one again who's drawing our attention towards this that this aspect is also very important all right so that is rousseau for you now kant in a nutshell he has written these very very famous critiques he is also skeptical about reason so look at the titles of the works the critique of the critique of pure reason the critique of practical reason and the critique of judgment and he talks about what is enlightenment in an essay so he talks for the liberation of man from in intellectual dependence on others so that is don't be dependent on others to get knowledge you can gain knowledge from your own experience so he speaks for society's openness to new ideas and he was against the bigotry dogmatism and despotism so any kind of authority any kind of blind faith any kind of uh, dogmatism is nothing but all kinds of uh, religious beliefs that actually make you stumble the things that kind of uh, make you scared of religion you know too much of teachings and preachings so he was against all that and he was also very um, doubtful about the claims of reason he was also not very um, happy about this extreme importance given to reason so he says reason has to be tempered with instinct instinct as in that basic uh, human um, belief or that base, basic human inclination that rousseau was also talking about so when you look at kant and rousseau they are almost of the same school of thought 
wherein they talk about tempering reason with emotion. You don't have to go with reason all the time. So what is the basic assumption that there are certain preconditions necessary for experience? That is uh, substance, causality, space and time. So these sense data is to be used for conceptual judgment and self-consciousness. So he's saying don't depend on other people to come and tell us what is truth and what is knowledge. Use your own brains, use your own heart. So you can see things, you can touch things, you can experience, you can connect the dots, you can look at the causality, cause and effect, you can look at space and time, you can look at the concrete evidence for things and based on that you create your own judgment about things and use your self-consciousness. So don't be a blind believer of religion, of dogma, authority, political theory, political inclination, whatever. Take your own judgment, make your own judgment based on all these things. So when you look at uh, Rousseau and Kant from there, you can see how the whole movement or how the whole world was now looking towards romanticism. So now you have this slight shift. The winds of change are already blowing. So from extreme rationality, we are moving towards another extreme or you could say another end wherein you are looking at emotions creativity thinking um, that is tempered with instincts all right so you can see the shift from the extreme intellectual to a more humane more emotional in terms of all kinds of belief, values, and theories. All right, so with this, we are done with the major thinkers. And now in the next section, we'll be talking about how these people influenced the Romantic movement, especially with reference to the two pioneers of the Romantic movement, that is William Wordsworth and S.T. Coleridge. And we'll be taking up two short poems by these two people and explain what romanticism actually means. <laughs>